we're in Igiagig, Alaska. It comes from the Yupik word Igiagig, which means like a like water down the throat. So any place you had a lake, like Lake Iliamna flowing into the Kwijak River, that's an Igiagig. We're 70 people right now, and we were moved up here in the early 1920s because our old village of Igiagig, which is located seven miles downriver, in 1919, the entire community was decimated by influenza and we had three survivors. People started living here year round because they didn't want their kids having to go away to school. So they thought we'll build a school here, we'll keep our kids at home and then they became permanent year round settlement. Here in Igiagig, food, water and energy are all interconnected and it's a holistic approach that's much more reflective of the way we feel. We never separate out one thing from the other. We get most of our food off of the land here in Igiagig. We're so fortunate. This Quijak River uh, is part of a watershed that supports 47% of the world's supply of sockeye salmon. So we put up hundreds. Last year, we did our family did 800. So we, we eat a lot of fish many different ways. And with climate change, all this brush is growing. So we have a moose population when moose used to be a lot more scarce. So now people are more likely to have moose in their freezer than caribou, but moose are so huge they feed for a long time. I think what's really underestimated and undervalued are how many gallons of berries people pick. Getting food to Igiagig is as expensive as a dollar per pound depending on what you're looking to get. So when these airlines started serving Igiagig on a seat fare basis rather than charters, expediting companies got linked. And so now I can place an order for the expediter to run anywhere in Anchorage and she'll throw it on a flight. And it's affordable. It's affordable, but it's a dollar a pound when you can grow it right here. You're in uh, one of three uh, greenhouses that we have here. We have two of these hoop tunnels like this and then a main greenhouse, which is actually built in with concrete and uh, the setup for heating and so it can be run year round. Uh, I run the greenhouses uh, most of the summer. I did it last year as well. Okay. Um, out here we have uh, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, a couple different types of kale. Kale and grows really well out here. Um, snap peas, lettuce. In the main greenhouse we also have like, squash, zucchini, tons of herbs like basil and cilantro, things that the community really want. Um, this year we're trying strawberries. We've got about eight or ten beds of a subarctic breed of strawberry. They're going really well. Cucumbers, tomatoes. I'm sure I'm leaving things out. but We also have three outdoor fields, um, a community garden downtown, and we're planning to build uh, another greenhouse where we can do hydroponics. Being able to produce a lot more, we started selling directly to the community, um, which is what we wanted, what the community wanted, to be able to, to help with, with produce costs and, and you know, flying stuff into rural Alaska. It, it costs a lot of money to be able to fresh vegetables, and they're not fresh by the time they get here anyway. So with this, you know, every Friday we do a farmer's market. I cut the stuff that morning, and it, you know, we sell it to the community. We still sell to a lot of lodges. Um, I say a lot, two or three lodges that, that we have good relationships with that, um, we sell a lot of our excess produce too. So Igiagig is located on Alaska's largest lake, Lake Iliamna. And it's a beautiful lake and the water is pristine, completely. It's our only source for our drinking water because our groundwater can't meet the state and federal drinking water standards. So that's why we had to move to a surface water system to begin with. And not only that, even when we were with groundwater, people still pack river water because it's, it, it's the best on earth. What I'm worried about and concerned about is our, our traditional preservation techniques use no cost of electricity. And these, these modern methods cost of, of all of it, canning from running the stove to just putting things in the freezer is, is very expensive. And if you were doing it commercially, our commercial rate is almost a dollar a kilowatt hour and it doesn't qualify for the power cost equalization. So it's a much more realistic figure to think about if that program goes away.
the clinic is an energy hog both in the heating and the electricity. The electricity we can't help so much because of all the medical equipment. Um, I think it was pretty energy efficient building itself, but the, the heating part, it burn, burns a lot of oil. So because we own our electric company, we can decide how we're going to handle people who want to integrate renewable energy. In Igiagig, we have several wind turbines. I think there are six total that generate electricity. They are 2.7 kilowatt sky streams, and that model was purchased so that if there was an issue, it could be taken off and sent in a small aircraft without needing large airplanes. It's a great honor to welcome you all to Igyagig Village today for the launching of the commercial RivGen power system. The RivGen is a bottom-mounted river turbine that spins with the current and produces power. It's a river generator. Go mm. figure. <laughs> We're putting a, a turbine under the surface of the river or in a tidal site and just harnessing that moving water. We're not diverting it or any, in any way. We're just using that natural moving flow to spin a turbine and produce electricity. This is exciting because we were working here with this community who really asked us to come here. They had started developing this, this river site in the Quijack River as a test site for hydrokinetic technologies. And this community wants to move towards sustainability in all ways. They are working on sustainability with food through their greenhouses and their subsistence lifestyle and they want to move towards a more sustainable energy future. Right now they depend on diesel energy for almost 100% of their electricity. It has flown in on at 2,000 gallons at a time in old DC-4 airplanes and is really expensive. They pay over $7 a gallon for fuel, almost a dollar a kilowatt hour for the electricity that's produced from those diesel generators. Not only that, but this fuel is stored in a tank farm right on the bank of the Quijack River and they really see a real threat to a fuel spill potentially endangering this river. And this river is the lifeblood of the community. They drink the water directly out of the river. The salmon that come up the river are the reason the community is here. Subsistence food they've relied on for generations and hope to continue to for years into the future.